Congratulations, graduates. In a few hours, you will leave University College, as I did, 34 years, or slightly in excess of one billion seconds ago. Enjoy this moment with your families and celebrate your accomplishments. A new beginning begins soon enough. When I first received a message from President Naylor, I wondered, did U of T wish to join our telescope project? Was he seeking a donation from an alum? Or was he about to inform me that I actually didn't drop that course in honors French literature? That it was required for a major in undergraduate astronomy and astrophysics? And that I would have to take the exam scheduled today at Hart House, <laughs> though I've never opened the textbook. President Naylor, I swear I never signed up for that course. And graduates take note, there is absolutely no statute of limitations on recurring exam nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else has had them, too. <laughs> President Naylor and Chancellor Wilson, I am particularly honored to receive this recognition from my alma mater, and it is humbling to join the distinguished list of previous recipients. On a personal level, I am exquisitely fortunate to have my parents vibrant and in good health here today to share this honor with me. Had I not been encouraged and supported in every way possible by my parents, by my husband, and by my children, I would not be standing here. I belong to a long line of University of Toronto graduates. Among them, my maternal grandfather, my father, my sister, my brother, my husband, and my brother-in-law. And I've had exceptional teachers, both in the Toronto public schools and here at the University of Toronto. I am so pleased that many of you are in the audience and on the stage today. What do I remember of my graduation ceremony a billion seconds ago this June? Absolutely nothing. Someone must have said something but not a single detail remains apart from arriving and departing this hall, not one. But of course, I'm confident that 34 years from now, you will remember every one of my words. <laughs> no doubt you are being bombarded with well-meaning advice from friends, family, teachers, career counselors, so much of what is being written in the news emphasizes diminished opportunity. Pundits tell you, be practical, focused, disciplined. At graduation ceremonies, it is customary to offer yet more advice. It's not clear to me, however, that you need to be burdened with more. Nevertheless, <laughs> I will make just one suggestion. Be wary about accepting advice. It can be as critical to reject advice as to follow it. Sift, weigh, and run all ideas through your own personal filter. In my own experience, the advice I ignored provided the springboard for all of my major decisions. In fact, a subtitle for my own journey could very well be the advice not taken. A few examples. My grade 10 physics teacher, when describing a, complex, a concept that was the least bit complex, would say to the class, the girls need not listen to this. What he didn't realize, of course, was that despite his absurd and to him apparently reasonable dismissal of half of his class. I loved the subject, 
and his comments only served to sharpen my attention. When it came time to decide whether to pursue a degree in astronomy and astrophysics, someone declared to me that there had been few women in the field, and certainly no Einstein or Newton. Could this be because women intrinsically lack the ability to do physical science? It was a male colleague who many years later pointed out that centuries and millennia of science have not produced an abundance of male Einsteins or Newtons either. Again, I decided not to accept well-intentioned practical advice and I went on to pursue a doctorate here, my first doctorate. As an aside, during my time at UC, women were not even allowed to observe at the telescopes at Mount Wilson and Palomar. The reason given, there were no restroom facilities in the telescope domes. The dormitories at Mount Wilson and Palomar were both nicknamed the monastery because they housed only men. One prominent astronomer, whose husband was a theorist, was finally allowed to observe at Palomar during the 1970s because her husband submitted the proposal and he was physically present at the dome, presumably to guard the washroom door. A few months after I joined the faculty at Carnegie, the new director came to speak with me. I had just begun my work on measuring the size and age of the universe. And as we heard, at that time, there was a rancorous debate in the astronomical community about the age of the universe. My preliminary results were yielding an age that was younger than the age of the oldest stars in our Milky Way galaxy, a clear paradox. Children cannot be older than their parents. Galaxies, stars cannot be older than the universe. Could I offer any plausible explanation? I offered a possibility at one time suggested and then rejected by Albert Einstein, but my director dismissed it. My results had to be wrong. In his view, it was a field that I ought to abandon, not exactly encouraging advice to a young scientist. But this problem fascinated me, and I wasn't willing to let it go. Ultimately, I led a Hubble Space Telescope key project to pursue it, and our results on the size and age of the universe, as we heard, turned out to be correct. And parenthetically, the Nobel Prize in Physics awarded last year was for the discovery that the universe is accelerating, the very explanation both predicted and then rejected by Einstein. I received plenty of advice about having a family as well. Wait until you've finished graduate school. Wait until you've finished your postdoc. Wait until you have tenure. But a more serious note was also sounded, a more somber note. Serious women cannot have both a scientific, or for that matter, any career and a family. Choose. I chose not to follow that advice. For me, it was unfathomable to imagine not having my own family. My husband and I have enjoyed over 30 years of working together in astronomy, but we both agree that our most remarkable collaboration has been raising our son and our daughter. I've been talking about a different time. Your time comes with its own challenges. In the foreground is a depressed economy and reduced opportunities. In this climate, all things practical seem imperative, while other pursuits appear frivolous or even dispensable. You are being asked, shouldn't today's graduates be trade-oriented? Does a liberal arts education serve us? Nowadays, funding agencies only want to support research that appears to have a direct economic impact or clear benefit to society. We easily forget that the comforts and capabilities most basic to us 
did not appear because people set out to invent new technology useful for our modern lives. Rather, they emerged because primarily young people with new ideas followed their impulse to understand the natural world. Light and heat for our houses, air conditioning for Convocation Hall, power for our laptops, our interconnectedness, our tools for medical diagnosis became available to us because of the curiosity of scientists exploring electricity and magnetism, sparks, the bizarre nature of magnets, and the inner world of the atom. In the 1920s, the inspired creativity of a generation of physicists, none of whom was motivated by anything other than a desire to understand the world of the atom, generated the theory of quantum mechanics. Yet this quantum revolution, interesting at first only to a handful of physicists, produced revolutionary breakthroughs giving society the transistor, lasers, laptop computers, x-ray machines, MRIs, the internet and World Wide Web, those now outmoded CD players, the cloud, not to mention Facebook, Twitter, and all the indispensable tools of your generation. Most of us are unaware that the satellites in the Global Positioning System, or GPS, that we use daily in our cell phones and cars require corrections for the effects of Einstein's theories of special and general relativity. Einstein neither focused on nor would have predicted any practical outcome for his theories. To explore the properties of light, to investigate the nature of space and time, to understand gravity, to ask questions as impractical for society and its ends as could be imagined. Einstein would have recoiled at the thought of being directed and funded only to do practical research. No one can predict the future, but you graduates will influence it. It will fall to you, the next generation of scientists and innovators, educators and writers, business investors and representatives in government to keep asking to allow yourselves the time and space to formulate questions for which there are as yet no answers. It will be your discoveries, your investments, that launch the next revolutions, revolutions that we cannot even begin to imagine. The joy of scientific and philosophic discovery, creativity in the arts and the sciences, these things do not change with time. Under any conditions, they are yours. With these words, I entreat you to take my advice as selectively as I have encouraged you to take all advice. My heartfelt congratulations to you and to your families. I feel fortunate to have had the honor of addressing you.